Recently, I've been playing the remake of The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, and immediately upon starting the return to an old adventure, I was instantly struck by a feeling of haze and dreamlike wonder. It felt surreal returning to the shores of Koholand Island, seeing a place I loved dearly as a kid in a fresh new look built from the ground up. Beyond this miniature toy-like aesthetic, there was something else that kept me in trance in that state of dreaming. I realized the edges of the screen were obscured through the use of a blur, and it hit me how powerful the small detail was. Despite the classic top-down perspective of the old days, I was able to see the world how Link does, incredibly unsure if it was real or being rendered as we were both progressing along. If it was only to instill a feeling of newness or unfamiliarity, the blurred edges would disappear with our growing familiarity of the island as we discovered more and more, but it remains, no matter how long we spend within Koholand Island. All of this got me thinking about the aesthetic language of storytelling in video games, and how that's used to help or disorientate players within worlds. The issue with aesthetics as a philosophy within art is the colloquial meaning has changed, with the rise of social media content specifically targeted to be as such. If you were to put up a 35mm photo, a lo-fi song, or a vaporwave collage of 90s imagery over a blue, pink, and orange backdrop, people would call those aesthetic, purely based on the fact they're visually pleasing or utilizing a non-conventional style. When in reality, aesthetic is just the means in which art is created, experienced, and thought about. Video games, the desire to play them, and even making videos such as these are all an aesthetic choice. For this episode in the language of video games, I'm gonna be talking about how visual aesthetics can help tell a story, sell a character, or even evoke certain feelings within us. Since video games are such a broad medium covering way too many games for me to fit in one video conducively, I thought it'd be fun to look at one of my favorite franchises, one ever evolving throughout time and iterations, The Legend of Zelda. To see how the use of aesthetic choices in relation to visuals and music have changed over the years to fit the hardware limitations, current relevance within the medium, and overall choices to tell that specific tale of Link. I need to make a clear distinction here about what I'll be talking about in regards to aesthetics since it is such a broad term. The choice to make interactive art, i.e. a video game, is a fairly obvious one. A lot of stories can be told through the medium and agency offers something wholly unique to games, so we won't be touching this at all. Right now I'll divide aesthetic into two separate creative choices. Mechanical, the way gameplay can tell a story or evoke feelings from players, and audiovisual, the way art style and music can do the same thing, sometimes in tandem and sometimes conflicting with the former. This video is going to be focusing on audio and visual aesthetic, since, for the most part, The Legend of Zelda has been widely criticized for maintaining a consistent mechanical aesthetic within the series. The tried and true, collect sword, go into dungeon, collect item, defeat boss with item, receive the legendary what have you use, defeat bosses, and return peace to the land. Very few Zelda games deviate from this, so it really is the perfect case study when it comes to how visual and audio aesthetics can help tell the same story in a different kind of way, by the way it sets a mood or evokes certain feelings with all the same beats in place. Since there is such an emotional connection tied to the different visual and audio aesthetics within games, and especially the variety used within the Zelda franchise, everyone is going to have a different story to tell, a different connection, or a point in which they entered the series themselves. With that in mind, I asked 8 amazing creators for their insight, and I'll let them introduce themselves now before we get started. Uh, my name is Javid, I am a filmmaker and I run a YouTube channel called Good Blood where I break down video games and explore the stories, the, in the intersection between game design and storytelling. So my name is Dachi, uh, I make and plan to continue to make in the future some video essays revolving around thematic elements of games and kind of the psychology behind games. My online username is King K, and I make, I guess, analysis videos that I call retrospectives. I, I'm not sure if you can call individual videos a retrospective, but I do, and people click on it still, so. I am Miss Fushi, and I'm a Twitch streamer, and I also occasionally make videos on YouTube having to do with video games. I am going by Wizzlewut. Just started getting back into making videos. I used to make videos a while ago under a different name. So I've come back to make sort of similar style stuff that I've made before. Review content, analytical content with a focus on like more personal analysis and relatability, I guess. 
Um, my name is Lady Pelvic of Pelvic Gaming, or some people call me Amber, and I review particularly JRPGs, but I do some like, you know, action adventures or platformers, and I do top five videos and sometimes convention blogs. Uh, I am Giancarlo Vasquez. I go by GZ Positive on the internet, and I make really long, comprehensive videos on old RPG series mainly. So my name is Jimmy Belikoff, uh, but online I go by the name Sunder, and I typically make videos related to game design and analysis, and I and shit post just a whole, just a lot on Twitter. With myself and all the guests here today, I brought in a wide array of ages. For the sake of context, I think it's important to talk about where we all started with the series. The Legend of Zelda is so incredibly vast and spans many titles over many generations that knowing the when and where we all started can help put into perspective our collective experiences. Personally, I started with A Link to the Past on the SNES when I was around six years old. I have photos of me as a child somewhere deep in my parents' storage container playing the original NES game, but I don't remember that at all. My actual first memory is with the next generation iteration. I didn't develop a connection until Ocarina of Time, when I was just old enough at around 9 years old to grasp what was happening in front of me. Not properly, but just enough to understand what was happening on screen. Every weekend for around a month, my family rented OOT from our local blockbuster that had two copies, and somehow my save file persisted until one day it didn't. That's when my parents decided to get me my own copy. I was so engrossed in the experience, I took the next day off of school to explore the world of Hyrule with Link. The next day off personal holiday is something that persisted with every subsequent Zelda release all the way up until Twilight Princess, which was the last game to come out while I was still in school. So my first memory, I think it was watching my friend play Ocarina of Time way back in the day, like when I was, must have been seven or something. And he was running around lo the Lost Woods. And there was something really fresh about it because I, I, I was a PlayStation kid. I never had a 64 growing up. So I had, I, I, I was brought up on Sonic and the Crash Bandicoots and the, the more linear, the more linear stuff. So my very first Zelda game that I ever played was, I believe, yes, it was Spirit Tracks for the DS, and I really enjoyed that game just because I loved the mechanics of it, and I loved the fact that Zelda came with you throughout the game, and there was just like good banter between the two, and I just liked the ending of the game too, so that was my very first like experience with the Zelda franchise. My first game was Wind Waker on the GameCube. And I vividly remember having to do the Triforce quest and being very confused and trying to get my dad to help me and he was he was so confused that he couldn't help me and it, <laughs> it it's funny that this is the first visible memory I have of Zelda because I didn't I never beat that game for like until years later because of that thing because not even my dad could help me so at that point I was like oh, I guess this is just useless. I, I'm not going to do it. I'm too dumb to do it. <laughs> I know for a fact we did own The Legend of Zelda on NES, but I don't have any memories I can grab out of my head from when I was little, only ones that my parents told me. So I, w I would say Ocarina is probably one of my my earliest memories is definitely that. And my, my brother played it. I played a little bit of it, but mostly it was it was very much like an old school Let's Play where I watched my father beat the entirety of the game while yelling things at him as he did it. Like, you have to do this, go here, do that, dad. And I don't know how he dealt with it, but he did. First Zelda game I think I played was actually Majora's Mask. And I received it as a gift, got that holographic label on the cartridge and it was weird man like that being my first zelda game just going into it and going through that intro sequence with all the like hallucination things when you're falling down the tree and like turning into the deku scrub i'm like what am i playing like this it was a really bizarre feeling you know i was very young and not very good at games so i very much struggled to get out of Clocktown. I, I don't think I ever got out of Clocktown when I first played it. 
and I just kind of, kind of ran around and like explored the town and it was still kind of fun as a kid even though I had no clue what I was doing. Ocarina of Time, that's my first Zelda game. I think like like one of the first memories where I was just kind of like, wow, was when you see Navi kind of go get Link, but it's from her perspective. So she's like, you know, going through fences, under people, over people. I think that was like one of the first things that I remember. But like the real thing that like was super engraved in my mind, I think was uh, Goma uh, from Ocarina of Time. You know, you go into the Deku tree and then she's the final boss, but like the door is closed behind you and it's pure dark and all you hear is and I was like, holy crap. You understand, I'm like, I don't know. I'm like 13 or something. I, don't, I, was, I wasn't ready for this. I wasn't prepared to take on a giant spider. So it just when you look up and you see this like glowing, orangey, yellow eye looking at you, that was just engraved in my soul, man. Link's Awakening was the first game that I owned because up to that point in my young life, it was all just my brothers had their Super Nintendo and their um, N64. Yeah, but the Game Boy Color was the first con like, you know, console or whatever game unit that was mine, that was just like my own. And Link's Awakening was the first game that I had on it. So I have a ton of fond memories of like back during like homeschool time, like that would be my, like I would always be playing Link's Awakening. I've beaten it, you know, a bunch of times. Booting up Ocarina of Time and starting a new game, putting in my name, and immediately regretting it when they used my name in the game. And I immediately deleted my save file and made a new one and just left it alone as Link. And that was my very first memory because it weirded me out that they were calling this kid who looked nothing like me, my name. There aren't many game series that can get away with a consistent change of aesthetic the same way Zelda does. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that one was never established in the first place. Like all good journeys through time, I think the best place for us to start with The Legend of Zelda is the beginning. Starting humbly on the original Nintendo Entertainment System back in 1986. But I think we all know the story by this point. Shigeru Miyamoto based the original idea of The Legend of Zelda off of his own childhood where he spent his days exploring caves and forests around his local village of Sonobi. By creating a vast and open-ended world, he wanted to invoke the feeling of exploring a new city for the first time, but the hardware was incredibly limited. Despite the challenges, the first Zelda game was incredibly successful in its attempt to create an open and explorable world full of secrets to find and dungeons to dive into. This was in part due to the world being mostly open from the very beginning, but a point I think goes relatively untalked about is the use of colour within its limitations. The NES, for as industry saving and revolutionary as it was at the time, was not very powerful even by then standards. It had enough memory to output a total of 54 colours, and limited to only 3 of those per tile or sprite at any one time. Careful consideration had to be put into place when creating the world of Hyrule, so Miyamoto and his team opted to use an analogous colour design, which is the use of two complementary colours, usually blue and green, with the contrast being yellow, and with black as the highlight. They serve another purpose as well, with the conveyance of emotion. Green, the main colour throughout almost all Zelda games, and used for Link's outfit, represents balance and harmony. Since most games start in some kind of natural setting, it complements the natural aspect of our main hero too. Brown, Link's secondary colour, at least in his original design, has an interesting psychology behind it. It's often seen as heroic, down to earth, and reliable, all things that can easily be projected onto Link. However, it's also viewed as safe and boring, which can also be said about a silent protagonist that players self-insert into. Obviously, this doesn't stay consistent throughout the entire series or even game, but the triad is used on the very first screen you see when starting your adventure and serves as the first impression. By clearly standing out as a mostly green avatar against the yellow background, it orientates players immediately and gives them a quick familiar connection with Link as a vessel to explore the world that surrounds him. Everyone's degree of connection with Link is vastly different. Some sympathize heavily with him and his plights, others simply use him as a tool to project themselves onto, or more commonly, the perspective changes from game to game. One thing that remains consistent, whether through Link or the world surrounding him, people have an incredibly strong connection in some form to The Legend of Zelda. What players probably didn't realize was just how strong that connection would become over the many years. One of the questions I asked my guests while interviewing them was, what comes to mind when I say Zelda aesthetics? 
and I got a wide variety of answers, but they can easily be divided between practicalities and emotions, or simply put, the look and the feel. Both are equally valid and coexist together, needing each other to complete the picture. I think the cool thing about Zelda games is that you know everything's working together for the same purpose. Everything's in service to the one goal. And so when you say aesthetic, I think of like a complete picture. There are barely elements that exist on their own to create their own thing. It's always in service to something bigger. Let's start with the look and then talk about how that can make us feel. One of the defining features of The Legend of Zelda is how its art style changes from almost game to game with few exceptions. From the on-plane air influenced Wind Waker evoking a sense of openness and adventure, to the more gritty attempt at realism seen in Twilight Princess that hinged itself on telling one of the most serious and, for lack of a better word, epic fantasy stories in the series. Every game's aesthetic has a distinct purpose it wants to use for its storytelling. The styles always perfectly match the themes and ideas created within. I think based on the art style, you can kind of sort of tell how serious maybe a game is going to be. Like Breath of the Wild, the story is, is pretty serious. Um, if you think about Wind Waker, it does deal with some serious things, but it's a little more lighthearted. Oracle of Ages and Seasons, Pixels, more lighthearted. I personally have not yet played Skyward Sword or, um, or the other one. Yes, Twilight Princess, there you go. When I look at those from someone who hasn't played them, they just look more serious. Just based on the style, everything looks just sort of dark when compared to, you know, Wind Waker, happy, Minish Cap, happy. It just, it, it looks that way. I think I think that's maybe why when I was younger I wasn't immediately drawn to them because I'm drawn to more like oh happy colorful cute kinds of things. Minish Cap will be a much different and frankly less compelling game if you were thrust into a world like Twilight Princess. The stark bright colors of a Saturday morning cartoon pair well with a story about a talking hat that helps you shrink down to the size of ants to help the incredibly tiny race of the Minish. Gritty realism would feel like an uncomfortable decision, probably leaving many scratching their heads. Obviously hardware limitations play a big role with how those aesthetics are achieved, but outside of a few, like Phantom Hourglass and Spirit Tracks, which have fantastic art direction and just happen to be let down by severely limited technical specifications, or Twilight Princess's Uncanny Valley with some character models and overuse of Bloom, everything does exactly what it needed to, no more and no less. If Zelda aesthetics had a spectrum, it'd have Wind Waker and Twilight Princess at opposite ends, while every game could be placed somewhere in between, but they all have one thing in common, their settings. Characteristically, Zelda's foundational aesthetic is of a high or medieval fantasy. There's a lot of surface level and easily identifiable modern and historical fantasy influence seen within all of Zelda. Hylians, one of the people inhabiting the land of Hyrule and beyond, are clearly variations of Germanic elves, especially those of the Kokiri and Ocarina of Time, since the origin of elves is as the protectors of the forest, but the influence goes much, much deeper than just pointed ears and fairies. I don't know why I think forest that's the first thing I think of because you know every level is like I just you know the forest man I think Ocarina of Time a lot so it takes me back to the forest but I think like medieval um fantasy I don't know elves I just that all reminds you of Zelda and just like adventure and kind of a giant world to explore yeah just adventure I would probably say like if you're talking like pure like visual aesthetics i just get like strong fantasy vibes but not it doesn't feel like western it, it has like it feels kind of like western fantasy but like a bit more like innocent in a way and and just more appealing to like a childlike attitude i guess kind of i wouldn't say medieval but like fantasy i guess more so it, it it's definitely I think taken the most inspiration from like like Link um, it looks most obviously like an elf and like it, it seems kind of like how Tolkien took inspir didn't take inspiration but became inspiration for so many concepts you know like so when I when I think like pretty much all of the Zeldas as drastically different different as they can be kind of take inspiration from that kind of fantasy like elvish there's lost woods and stuff like that it's in that kind of time period so that's probably what I would say. While the medieval setting can be incredibly strict, like that scene in The Adventure of Link, with the way towns and villages are stylized, or a lot less so with Wind Waker Seas or Skyward Sword Skyloft, 
This is where every single iteration at least starts and builds out from. Outside of the predominant staples of medieval fantasy like big castles, sword and shield cladded knights, or evil doing wizards, one thing that Zelda leans heavily on within the tropes is religion. The religious elements of Hyrule have been adjusted to fit within its own universe over the years. If you were to talk about religious beliefs within, you'd point to the three goddesses of creation. Din, creator of the land, Nairu, who gave the world law and order, and finally Faror, creator of all life to exist in the lands. The Hylian mythology is very loosely based on Christianity and creationism, although split into three to represent the Triforce's different sections with each goddess. Every game preceding Ocarina of Time, where the goddess religion was introduced, is very clearly Christian. From Link's shield having a crusader cross on it, to even this promotional art of our hero kneeling before a crucified Jesus in what's very clearly a western church. Even in the original game's Japanese text, the Book of Magic, is simply called the Bible. Mechanically, A Link to the Past may be seen as the game that set the series in stone for the majority of its lifespan, but Ocarina of Time is where the series began to shape its own aesthetic identity, with the origin of the lore we now see strewn throughout the series, giving more significant meaning to the Triforce as more than just a MacGuffin to collect. What's more interesting is when these ideas get played around with. It's easier to tell for me with like Majora's Mask and Twilight Princess and Wind Waker probably. Like with Wind Waker it seems like more, I guess it's more of a low-key story in the beginning. It is kind of surprising that Wind Waker tackles some meatier themes in its ending, given its art style is a bit more kid-friendly, I guess. Um, but I guess most of that adventure is pretty light, for a Zelda game anyway. Majora's Mask and Twilight Princess, which are definitely more impenetrable in that sense, where they're, you get Majora's Mask where it's just this looming sense of nothing ever feels quite like it's right or it's supposed to be. There's always a, a piece of the puzzle missing somewhere and you look up in the sky and you just remember that nothing is right. Like you, you walk around and you're, you're having fun, you're adventuring, and then you look up and you're like, oh yeah. This is the inescapable dread that everybody's feeling right now. And I, I think that fits in with its very hopeful, ironically, message that the ending brings with it. So I, I think in those ways, it definitely... I think the art styles often fit with the expectations you have going in and with the strength of the theming, probably. Twilight Princess might be my favorite example of Nintendo distorting what a medieval fantasy can look like. At first glance, Twilight Princess might resemble the most traditional epic fantasy game in the series along with the adventure of Link, but once things start to kick off a bit more with the realm of Twilight designs, the almost future tech and moody soundtrack, it's easy to conceive the conventions are there and traditional and have less so been flipped on the head and more warped to fit this melancholic tale. On a technical level, it's easy to say it's one of the least well-aged games since Nintendo decided to go as realistic as the GameCube and Wii could allow. Beyond all the oversaturated bloom, there's a lot more to be found underneath. Mixing Native American iconography, bleak vastness, and oppressive futuristic magics with what we commonly associate with fantasy fiction. Let me put it this way, I can't think of a Zelda game that had an aesthetic that didn't assist that specific game with what it was trying to do. And this is including the games that I don't think are very good. like. I think Skyward Sword's aesthetic works for Skyward Sword, even though I don't really like Skyward Sword. And same with Twilight Princess, even though I don't think that they managed to hit the mark on the, the dark story that they were trying to tell as well as they thought they were going to, I don't think that game would work with a different aesthetic. I think like some tweaks maybe, but like that sort of like oppressive, high detail, you know, like gloomy aesthetic that it has really lends to it. Like I couldn't name a Zelda game that like just like fucking sucked as far as aesthetic versus their story that they're trying to tell. Magic systems are par for the course in any medieval adjacent story, and Zelda is no exception. I was watching this video on creating an argument in defense of soft magic systems, but he was breaking down how um, so like fantasy worlds and, and stories, how they use hard magic systems. So say like Harry Potter, that's a hard magic system world where you've got a spell and magic happens. But then you've got a, a soft magic system in Lord of the Rings where you don't quite know what it can do, but it's more of a metaphor for the burdens that people carry, right? So soft magic systems are more, more metaphor based, 
whereas hard magic systems are more logic based. And thinking about how Zelda games manage to kind of do the two. So they've got hard magic systems. You've got the magic meter and Din's fire and, and all that stuff. And even like the use of music is, is magic. But then you've got these other elements of magic that feel like they have a hold on the on the universe, say like the bonds of friendship and loyalty and and all this stuff that seems to play a part in like the the connections between the characters. So say like Saria and Link, there's this, this bond of friendship and that that has a sense of magic um, in in the story. So I think that's that's one element that I feel like sets apart from some other fantasy stories is, is they explore both sides of it. The, um, the magic of, of human connection, but also like the hard magic and the satisfaction you get out of using like Din's Fire. This video is brilliant and everyone should check it out, but there's a moment where Hello Future Me talks about the rest of us just live here, and he says something about it that could very easily be applied to a story like Majora's Mask. It's, it's got a soft magic edge to it, but it's fundamentally about anxiety and what the hell it means to be an adult. A story of anxiety, growing up, and what it's like to grow apart from those you care about, even when you don't want to, within a world that's full of transforming masks, undying skeletons, and conducting ghosts. These all serve to tell bigger, grander stories than if they were grounded in what could be explained. Zelda's strength has always been laid in the unexplained, giving us just enough to latch onto, but never too much that we can't draw our own conclusions and theories from what we're given. And I think the games that have the softer aesthetic, the narrative is a lot more character driven, because Skyward Sword, I would say, has like a softer aesthetic, similar to Wind Waker in that way. I think those kind of games are definitely a lot more character driven than the other ones. Majora's Mask is kind of in its own like weird gray area, but Ocarina of Time and Twilight Princess, I feel like those games are very traditional in their storytelling. And it's not, it's kind of more about the overall plot. It's not as much about Link as a character in my opinion. Well, I think, for example, like Majora's Mask, again, um, because it's so dark and um, kind of unwelcoming and, I don't know, you feel like this thick darkness kind of looming over you. Literally, the, the moon is looming over you, you know? I think that kind of helps give this feeling of like impending doom and, and fear and, you know, the clock's ticking. Um, and then we have like Wind Waker. I don't know, Wind Waker's just so bright and happy and... I mean, not all of Wind Waker is bright and happy, but I think the majority of it, you know, when you're sailing and... I don't know, it, it kind of shows, like, adventure, the big blue open sea and even the sky above. You know, it's almost like explore, like, look at all this this, this land or I guess this water, really, to cover and, and see what... I don't know, it encourages you. Oh, like Twilight Princess actually is a good one too. Um, it is Twilight Princess is pretty dark, you know, not as good as Majora's Mask, but you know, it's definitely pretty dark. And when you go to like the Twilight Realm, it's very like muddied colors. Even the art, I think, is kind of like darker, has like a realistic tone. The Zoras look muddied, you know. The Zoras look like kind of a realist, and it just I don't know. It's it definitely has the same presence of of darkness and uh, you know. The, not the underworld, but we got the Twilight Realm, you know, the kind of a connection there. It's that Twilight Princess does a good job of that. Outside of evoking certain feelings or simply just being a setting, Zelda has managed to become not only iconic, but easily navigated through its design decisions within the realm of medieval fantasy. The vast openness of the different Hyrule fields, open ocean or the off-worldly termina. It's easy to keep your bearings no matter the art design. This seems to be the most important focus of the Legend of Zelda world design, often opting to have a focal point to keep players anchored there, having somewhere to come back to and branch back out from upon returning from adventuring deep within. Whether it be the distance and dominating Hyrule Castle, a village to feel a sense of comfort, or a giant clock tower reminding you of an impending doom. Even if the anchor isn't your point of interest to keep going, other landmarks will surely help you along your way. Environments are varied but consistent throughout. You know where you are at any given time, and with enough experience within the franchise, what to expect from it. Is there a tall mountain? It's probably inhabited by rocky Gorons. A desert? Gerudo will be waiting there to step on you. A beachside? Zoras will most likely be waiting. These ideas getting flipped is part of what makes Majora's Mask so uncomfortable. 
All the ideas are there, but they've been twisted beyond what we know. Even in more open games like Wind Waker or Breath of the Wild, there are clearly defined areas to explore. Walking between provinces in the latter has an almost World of Warcraft immediacy to crossing its borders. It's abrupt, maybe jarring upon the first time doing it, but once you understand those state lines, you know that it helps keep your sense of an internal compass consistent. Areas within each and every Zelda game are clearly segmented and defined by what they are with little exception, and that's what has helped, among many years of consistency to this philosophy, tie us to these games emotionally. We know these areas, even if the game and aesthetics change, it still feels like a home away from home. This idea may be a reason Skyward Sword felt so disconnected for a lot of players, for as beautiful as Skyloft is, it's completely separated from the world, imploring players to take a leap of faith below the clouds to find familiar ground, with no running between areas. Functionally, it's similar to a lot of areas players previously used for orientation, but it's a forced anchor instead of a naturally occurring one. Now that we've looked at some of the fundamental and tangible aesthetics of Zelda, let's look at something a bit more esoteric, and in my opinion, more fun. The emotional responses to the things we just talked about. These are a lot harder to nail down, since talking about a feeling or a reaction is harder to describe as a deliberate aesthetic choice. When I think about aesthetics, I think about like a feeling or a mood, almost. And I guess if you said Zelda aesthetics, I'd think about one particular experience when I was a kid. I used to watch my dad play Ocarina of Time when I was little. Um, I didn't play it myself very much, but I always watched him play because he was like my video game hero. And he would always play late in the evening while my mom was cooking dinner and listening to like Celine Dion or Mariah Carey or stuff like that. So weirdly, the aesthetic that Zelda reminds me of is that sort of thing, like that, that, that old style music playing in the background, the smell of my mom's food, Zelda on the screen. I associate it more with like a memory. I get like this mixture of like Wind Waker and like the Skyward Sword like music just coming together. I get like this feeling of like adventure and just very pretty graphics with like a world that you want to explore essentially. For me, when, when people talk about aesthetics, it's usually about visual appearance as well as how that kind of creates a tone in it. Like you can look at a setting in something and immediately get a feel for what kind of emotions it's trying to get out of you. So when, when I hear Zelda aesthetic, a lot of it is very, very hominess, very comfortable settings, very warm. To me, that's, that's generally the emotion Zelda wants to get across, even in like the more lonely aspects of it or the lonely entries like Breath of the Wild can be a very lonely game, but it's still very comforting in its loneliness. Something I have come to learn from these interviews, writing this video, researching everything online, and just talking to people about The Legend of Zelda, is that it's a very personal experience to most people. Which should have been obvious from the start of this project, I guess. But just because I felt the way I did and grew up with the series in such a way, didn't mean everyone else had that same response. Maybe that was short-sighted of me. Maybe the natural reaction to growing up with something so personal is you're afraid to express how you feel about it to anyone other than those close to you. Or maybe I'm just thinking too much into it. With any long running and loosely connected series, where you jump in won't necessarily define your favorite, but it can often be the case. Even the memories of a certain time and place with a game can really help cement it in our mind as something we will truly cherish forever. That would be a link to the past. Um, I have really fond memories of sitting in the back of my mother's minivan and we used to drive around a lot because we used to move around a lot and uh, just to my left and right was a lot of boring stretches of farmland and you know the Everglades because in the in Florida the Everglades makes up like a third of the southern part of it and I remember I would get so tired of looking that but whenever I was playing like on my on my Game Boy like the the settings of that stuff and the way they things were drawn would would get my attention and those drives would be over in an instant whenever I would play and I have a lot of fond memories of playing A Link to the Past and especially going between the dark world and the the normal world and just kind of like escaping into that setting with with the uh the weird looking trees and Link as the little bunny guy and stuff like that 
Like Miss Fushi said, the aesthetic of Zelda to her is the memory of watching her dad play with the smell of mom's cooking coming through as they adventured together. And for me, it's kind of the same. When I think of Zelda, I think of my 11th birthday. I had just gotten Majora's Mask, I ripped it open, chucked it in my Nintendo 64 along with my fancy new expansion pack, and played all day. Granted, I was 11 and didn't know how to get out of Clocktown for the life of me, but I just explored every nook and cranny as Deku Link, thinking about what waited for me beyond the gates, all while dreading that moon. By some cosmic coincidence, the sky outside my bedroom was illuminated by a supermoon, and I spent the night hiding under my bed waiting for the inevitable. This game with its eerie music and constant anxiety of a looming moon, all disguised as a bright kid-friendly adventure had gotten to me. It was the first time I think a video game had ever left an impact on me beyond turning off the console. Not even Ocarina of Time did that to me. Majora's Mask is a summation of what Zelda and its aesthetics mean to me, and how games can stay with us long after we stop playing them. I think the way that they view their own games, the developers, is that they have this toolbox of Zelda stuff. Uh, races, mechanics, um, names, locations. And they use that toolbox to create a new story, right? So like, great example, Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask. They had to reuse a lot of the same assets and the names, you know, and, and I think, you know, obviously that's a kind of like a one-off story. They had to make that game in a year, etc. But how much that is such a great like allegory for the way that they view all the other games where they, they just have these assets ready to go. Okay, we want to make a new Zelda game. What helps to make that Zelda game feel like a Zelda game are all the names and the connections to other things, but they're in service of a new story. They're, they're, they're in service of a new experience. Nostalgia is a core part of what has become Zelda's design principles. A series doesn't start on its own nostalgia, but as it grows and fan bases become attached to certain aspects, it's easy to see what can be used to evoke the good feelings people once had prior and harken back to our memories helping to sell a moment or an idea. How many of you hear the opening cascade of notes of the Ocarina of Time title screen and can't help but remember where you were when you first played it? And there's a reason for that. Music is powerful. It's evocative and can set a mood or provide an impact to a scene that could never have been done without it. Within the toolbox of things Zelda games can use, there's dozens of melodies interwoven through different instruments, sound fonts, and keys to give different feelings with similar music. The original NES Zelda title screen starts off low and empty, reflecting how the game begins, but picks up quickly to provide a sense of hopefulness and light in this dark adventure. Contrasted with the Link to the Past title screen, it's less lonely of a song because a Link to the Past is less lonely of a game than the original title. I don't want to spend too long discussing Zelda title screen music because honestly, I could do that. They are a masterclass of musical motif storytelling. In a Wired interview, series composer Koji Kondo, when asked about creating music for the franchise, compared the process with the original Mario Bros saying, the sound of Mario is like pop music, but Zelda is like music you've never heard before so I try to incorporate different kinds of music to create an otherworldly feel, which was incredibly effective. While the overworld and even title theme might be reminiscent of traditional epic medieval fantasy, the dungeon theme is droning. It's almost oppressive, sitting over everything else within the same screen to give you the sense of tension you wouldn't find anywhere else. This idea of otherworldly and unheard of before music is something that has been carried all the way through the series with great effect. Forest Temple from Ocarina of Time. It's just like uh, one of the most amazing ambient tracks, especially for the N64 that can like, <laughs> couldn't really do a lot with it, uh, with the sound chip. Like a lot of those songs, they sound good as like Mario 64 because it's these big like, like it's just these old keyboard sounds that work for these like poppy little chip songs, but uh, yeah, somehow in the middle of Ocarina of Time, they just managed to put out this just absolute, I don't even know what it would consider. It, it sounds like you're in a creepy forest. Like, if creepy forest was a genre of music, that would be the song. And I don't know, it's just, it sounds like there are, like, druidic, druidic forces or, or spooky fairies or forest sprites that are, like, watching you and, like, giggling as you're as you're navigating it's, it's such a good song like with anything involving music everyone has their own favorite song or soundtrack and why be it for an emotional resonance or simply just enjoying a melody and the feeling it gives you in game 
From the ethereal piano of Fee's themes in Skyward Sword, to the light-hearted chiptune arrangement of Torque Island in Oracle of Seasons, we all have something to connect to. I was playing Skyward Sword the other day, and that has a great soundtrack. It's more Americana, yeah, leaning into the, the real Western approach to, to composing. Not that I prefer Western over like Eastern ideologies when it comes to composing, but like it, it just felt massive when, you, when you're in the air. Oh man, it's great. And uh, the Skyloft song, but I also love the Wind Waker. That did a really good job. I think with the Wind Waker, when you're on the boat and you're sailing across the ocean, the has a good way of just creating a sense of vastness. It's really big in these longer notes and it's not overcrowding um, the, the music. It's not too heavy, it's just it's just wide. That did a really good job at, at creating that, that feeling of wide and vastness. I would say like between Majora's Mask, Wind Waker, and Skyward Sword. But then I also like Breath of the Wild, but that it's for like a completely different reason. But I'd say out of all of them, I would probably have to go with Majora's Mask just because I'm so familiar with it. And there are just so many good songs on that OST. How many Zelda OSTs were Koji Kondo? Which is like, there. it's like picking your favorite child. Even Zelda 2 has just a killer soundtrack. All of, I mean, all of them. Even the ones where uh, Kondo sort of like gave up the reins. Even, you know, the games that aren't, aren't scored by Kondo is like, they're, they're all, like I can't name, I can't name a soundtrack among them that I'd put under like a 9 out of 10. See, I could go with nostalgia and say like Ocarina of Time, but I don't think I'd necessarily like put that on to jam with. I like the music and Breath of the Wild, but most of it that I remember off the top of my head is like environmental sounds and stuff like that. Maybe I'd give it to the, the Link's Awakening remake. Maybe I would do that because it's just it's, it's very happy and music is a big part of that game. So there are a lot of good songs within it. Oh my God, Deku Palace. People may think it's annoying, the obnoxious trumpets, but let me tell you something. On my tube TV, you know, before like we had cool stereos and stuff like that, you know, like the plug-in and all that, like, <laughs> all I had, I would put, go to the Deku Palace, I would turn my TV all the way up, and I would just listen to that song while I drew. Like, I just, I love, like, Majora's Mask has a nostalgic sound to me. When I hear it, I'm like, oh, I've been here before. Oh, it just brings me back, you know? The Astral Observatory from Majora's Mask. Like, I don't really know how to describe it. It just has this very mystical feeling to it. For that to come up in a game like that, you kind of walk into that, that observatory. At that point in time, it's this anxiety within you trying to finish the Clock Town sequence without making any mistakes so that the you game over pretty much and you walk into the observatory and you kind of feel the way the song is you just kind of feel like time is like stopping for a moment and you're just kind of like taking in like the universe in a really weird way but i'm gonna go with wind waker because wind waker's soundtrack is always present Wind Waker soundtrack, they, I mean, if you look at it, if you look like at a playlist on YouTube, there are parts of Wind Waker soundtrack that are like six seconds long. And it's just for that one moment where you look around the corner in the fortress and you see all the girls in the jail cell. Out of context, that sounds horrible, but little things like that where the soundtrack is 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 ever present and they always have like these little like, where even, even a small little moment in a cutscene where there's no music at all has like a, like a little like a little a little a little a little tune to carry the the scene forward favorite song maybe a little predictable is probably city in the sky because it's just i, I think that's the moment that it, that that song is so it's so lonely like there i don't know how that city got up there i don't know who used to live there there's so much about it that I don't know. How does it float? It's just so separated from everything else in the game that it was always so striking to me. I, I would just kind of sit and look off the edge while it's, the, the song is so trippy. I don't know. I guess it's kind of a short loop maybe, but I don't want to say it's a pleasant song. It's more like a ethereal song. Like it's just, that that's definitely my favorite song.
probably an out of left field pick compared to the like your dragon roost or your but that that's i think it's because that's where i fell in love with the sky aesthetic what adds more weight to koji kondo's statement about music being otherworldly is the blurred line between diegetic and non-diegetic music used throughout the franchise meaning music that exists in the world as link and the player can hear it and just music we the players can hear. There are some obvious examples of diegetic music such as anytime Link plays a song, or non-diegetic being anytime Link opens a chest, but outside of a strict few examples, the use of very specific instrumentation and ambient sounds within the various soundtracks creates such a unique and memorable atmosphere within each game. Dragon Roost Cavern simulates the sound of lava bubbling over, Gerudo Desert Shrine has the sound of shifting sand, and Ganon's castle from Ocarina is an oppressive sound of the organ Ganon himself is playing. All of this is to say, when Koji Kondo said the music is otherworldly, he really meant it. I think music is the one aesthetic that will keep us tied to a game, series, or even just level for long, long after we finish playing it. More than anything else a game can do visually, music can be listened to anywhere and remixed by anyone to help bring new life to an old favorite, giving us those little notches of nostalgia when we need it most. Better yet, the nostalgia tied to remixes has given a new life to what it means to be an audio aesthetic, and the Zelda soundtracks and sampling are no exception. I can't count how many times I've heard a little soundbite from a Zelda game pop up in a song, and a smile cracks my face. Thinking about the direct connection me and the artist now have because of that one sample. I know there was a some dubstep remix of some Zelda song I used to listen to in college, back when that was a thing. And <laughs> I really liked it because, um, you know, it, it, there was some part where the music just dropped and Navi just goes, hey, listen, and then it, it drops again. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is cool. I went to a Dead Mouse concert and one of the openers, uh, he played a Zelda remix and he like, it was one of those like, raise your hands in the air moments, but he like put his hands up and made a triangle and like a, the whole crowd just like you know, mirrored and made the triangle back and like it dropped to just like a Zelda remix. And it was, that wasn't necessarily when being nerdy was uncool, but like nerdiness was just starting to like get a little bit more cool in the mainstream. And so it was like cool for me as a nerd kid to be around these people that I was, I just assumed they're all like this, like dance music, they're here to dance. And everyone was like also low key into Zelda. As somebody who listens to that music, with the experiences that I have, it does feel very like nostalgia bait, but the tunes from Zelda, I think are so iconic that even if you can't appreciate where they came from, like they still sound so good. Like you can slot something like the Song of Storms into any sort of style remix that you want and it's gonna sound interesting to somebody i think that hasn't heard it before so i wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of people that do end up hearing that not understanding what zelda is and then getting curious i can see a world where that happens I haven't touched on every game in the same amount of detail and honestly there's a couple of reasons for that. The first is it would simply take too long from writing, playing and even watching perspectives. Time is hard to find. The other is even though I have played every game in the mainland series at least once, oftentimes way more, I naturally gravitated towards the console releases despite my love of the handhelds. My heart is with the series as I saw it on my television and not on car rides or hiding my Game Boy when I should be asleep. I just wanted to put this little addendum here to say if your favorite game in the series isn't talked about in the same depth as others, I'm sorry. It doesn't invalidate your love of the series and why you hold it so close, and please feel free to share your experiences with me. When work started on Zelda 64, later known as Ocarina of Time, it had a laser focus on the cinematics of storytelling. Like I said earlier, Ocarina of Time added to the Zelda franchise its own expanded lexicon and religion all shown and explained to you multiple times through multiple cutscenes. It's one of the most beloved, not only within its own franchise, but within the entire medium, and for a reason. As a kid, when did you your first video game? You know, it wasn't my first video game, but it was definitely one of the first. You know, just the smallest things like that stand out to you, and you're, you're just instantly transported to this, like, world of splendor and wonder, like, oh, a fairy, like, woo, you know? For everyone that grew up with the series beforehand, it was doing something completely and utterly new. 
that had never been seen before. For everyone that played it at the time as their first Zelda game, it had such a deeply compelling story, a giant, for the time, open world ripe for exploration. And for fans that jumped into the series later and went back, it marks the beginning of a new era of Zelda. One where a lot of the canon can be traced back to. If the universe was made of planets in the shape of Zelda games, Ocarina of Time would be the sun in which they all rotate around. This probably sounds like biased favoritism, but in all honesty, it's not my favorite Zelda game. Hell, I wouldn't even put it in my top three, and it might barely scrape into my top five if you caught me on a good day. I just think that its importance in how the series evolved and became its own singular identity can be attributed to it. Everything beforehand was experimenting. Zelda 1 was bleak, alone, and empty. Zelda 2 was overpopulated and a more typical fantasy story. Link's Awakening was a stranded dream, and A Link to the Past was Dungeons and Dragons. This isn't to say future games didn't experiment, but they all experimented from the same foundation and built their stories around the same established canon. As a result, cinematics became a staple of Zelda games. The story was now at the forefront. Even smaller handhelds had a big story push with the established world. As this began to seep into more and more games as time went on, a pushback emerged with how much it slowed games pacing down. For as much as I love how ambitious the storytelling is in Twilight Princess, it's hard to deny the time it takes to get there. And like in Skyward Sword, obviously the story wasn't the only problem. While the relationships it manages to establish are some of the best, especially that scene between Link and Zelda actually feeling genuine for once, it's hard to deny the snowball of story focus from Ocarina came to a head for better or worse when Breath of the Wild. So when Breath of the Wild pulled all the way back to simplify and for the most part let you dictate the pace and even order of the storytelling, it was a welcome change and return to form. One of my favorite things to look back on when making this video, because I remember it clear as day at the time, was the controversial announcement for Wind Waker. For those who don't know, Wind Waker, everyone's beloved and wonderfully aged favorite, wasn't so warmly received when it was first shown off and had a lot of disdain towards it in the lead up to release. It might sound bizarre in retrospect, but, but let me give some context as to why that was. When the GameCube was announced at Space World 2000, it was shown alongside a demo reel of various games Nintendo was working on. Luigi's Mansion, Metroid Prime, and of course, Zelda 128. At the time, it was as realistic as a Zelda game could look, and was the next step in the 3D aesthetics laid before it with Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. It was only logical this is what a next generation Zelda game should look like. The following year at Space World 2001, Wind Waker was first revealed in all of its cell shaded glory to a less than enthusiastic audience wanting that more realistic Zelda. Similar to Wind Waker but much less controversial was Breath of the Wild vs the Zelda HD experience shown off at E3 2011. And this is more anecdotal, but I remember seeing rumblings online of slight disdain towards the more anime aesthetic, a fairly big departure from what was shown. The Zelda HD experience was just a quick little spider boss fight showing off the capabilities of what the Wii U could do. While the outrage wasn't as vitriolic as the prior Space World, it's still an interesting case study. And maybe it was an attitude at the time. I don't know what like the culture was like back then, but I, I would imagine it was even more dude bro -y than it is now. And... I, I, I could kind of see the direction of the industry was probably skewing FPS more than it was, I don't know. I, I think the, the drive for realistic looking graphics was probably there a lot. And nowadays it feels like a good looking game comes out every five seconds. So I, I don't know that it's that people care that much about that stuff anymore. So I, I but maybe that had an effect on the way people think about it. I don't know. I definitely think it had an impact. When you look back on it, at least when I look back on it, I it's funny to me because it becomes really clear how public perception can flip like on a dime almost because these days after all that mess, you kind of look back and laugh and say, "Wow, People were so short-sighted back then, just so judgmental for just looking at this and it not being what was in their head, like they're just ready to to say no to it. But I think it makes the case even stronger for that style of game because 
you know, that kind of uh, public perception was was overcome and like a game like Wind Waker is just so uh, so beloved now, especially for its art style. I think the impact of of those events is knowing that the audiences slash the consumer have penetrated the wall between us and the developers. So on some level, when we're playing these new Zelda games, we know we've had an impact to some degree. Another example being the timeline in Hyrule Historia, how that is such a fan generated product. You know, it's, it's considered official by the developers. They had input in creating it, but I've got a feeling that they had, it was not seen as important until the fans wanted to piece it together and started. I mean, dude, I, the last couple of years I've watched so many like panels and interviews with developers and, and the amount of questions that get shot out from like an open mic um, like format are questions about the timeline. Okay, for like the child line is this, how do you explain the Zoras in this timeline? You know, and it's just, like, it doesn't, at least this is my, this is my feeling is that it doesn't matter. And I know for the developers, it, that doesn't matter. What, what, when you're looking at the game in front of you, you're, they're hardly ever thinking about the game that comes after. Uh, I can even say at the time, being the, the young, edgy teen that I was. And, uh, so yeah, no, I think that absolutely colored it because like I didn't want to play it my friends didn't want to play it we all thought thought it looked dumb and then we saw some video video footage and they're, they're like focusing on like Link's eyes move around they track your target and we're like okay that's kind of cool it still looks dumb though and then it finally came out and we all caved and we all bought it we all loved it because Wind Waker is a great game that moment of just sort of like being humbled by how good a Zelda game was despite the fact that we were all like well but it looks dumb I think that has kind of just stayed in the social consciousness about like around Wind Waker because I think that almost everybody that I know that that like was paying attention during that time is still like, yo, you remember like how much bad rap that really good game got before it came out because nobody even knew. So there's just this kind of like like an aura. I don't know how to describe it. Like Wind Waker, like beat the odds and still proved to everybody that it was just a kick-ass Zelda game. And so now everybody kind of like has a lot of respect for Wind Waker as like a, we're sorry, we're sorry. <laughs> like, we'll never doubt you again. To me, this shows how fans think they know what they want until they get exactly what they ask for. And then suddenly it's not. It's a classic monkey's paw situation. Imagine if Nintendo had listened to fans when Wind Waker was announced and pivoted to something more akin to Zelda 1 to 8. We wouldn't have gotten one of the most highly praised and self-preserving games in the entire franchise. I think Nintendo's Zelda team has established a sense of trust with which they can kind of do what they like, at least aesthetically, and be able to pull it off. Their art styles perfectly suit the story they want to tell, be it a big open sea cartoon, a dreamlike toy box adventure, or an open world epic. Even if some of those games didn't completely hit the mark, there's always love and care put into building those worlds and cherished by many regardless. If you asked a group of people what game they wish they could play again for the first time, chances are a big chunk would say Breath of the Wild, and I honestly don't think it's due to the mechanics, since weapon degradation seemed like such a contentious choice. A lot of people criticised the idea of all the shrines looking the exact same with their clinically sterile future tech aesthetic that seemed mysterious upon first visit but worn thin pretty quickly. And the dungeons, while being impressive on the outside, also suffered the same fate on the interiors as the shrines did. A lot of monotony. So why then did people constantly return to Breath of the Wild, sink dozens if not hundreds of hours, and yearn for the experience again? While I don't think I can definitively answer for everyone, I do think I have some idea from what we've talked about throughout this entire video so far. What makes Breath of the Wild so special is how it took the toolbox of Zelda, and instead of picking and choosing from it, used all of it in some way or another. There can be more subtle things, like calling back place names such as Crenel Hills from Minish Cap, to more directly emotional ties, like the Temple of Time thing being in pieces to match the state of its in-game location. It's this kind of nostalgia people really connect with. It's a reminder of earlier times without relying on in-your-face references that can either break the feel of a game or completely put newcomers to a series off entirely. 
Saying Breath of the Wild is a monumental achievement is nothing new, and it has received that praise for very good reasons. I just want to acknowledge that sometimes the best way to use your game's previous aesthetic choices, from stories, music, and characters, is how it's done in Breath of the Wild. Sometimes you can play similar enemies in a game, and the design gets lost in a complete art style shift, and that's okay. Reimagining the wheel, or sometimes just its treading, will not always be met with great praise, and that's fine. Just knowing they're there is enough to appease the nostalgia appetite. Zelda is a franchise that has put its fingers in many, many different aesthetical pies, so to speak. But Breath of the Wild is not only a celebration of the Zelda toolbox, it's the culmination of it. Looking forward, I don't see any main series, non-remake games changing art styles. And that might be a hugely contentious issue, since the foundation of Zelda is built upon the consistency of change. Before Breath of the Wild, it felt like everything was an experiment and waiting for the right technology to be invented. Like I said, Zelda aesthetics are a spectrum, from Wind Waker to Twilight Princess. And if you were to ask me, Breath of the Wild is right smack bang in the middle. It achieves that perfect balance they've been trying for the entire life cycle. It was a complete burning down of everything we knew. It felt like the developers and designers were yelling at us to forget everything we knew about Zelda from this point on, so I personally don't see them changing it anytime soon. I hope this video has helped give some insight into aesthetics, the moods and emotions they can evoke, and how Zelda can tell similar stories through different art styles and the different ways we react to them. Visual and musical aesthetics are such an important factor in a game's complete picture. Pairing them with the right mechanics, story and themes are such a difficult thing to get right from every perspective, but more than most, Zelda succeeds at this fairly consistently. Again, I am sorry if your favourite wasn't properly represented in this video, but I do mean it when I say I want to hear about your connection to the aesthetics of Zelda and what they mean to you. I want to give a huge thank you to my guests, for whom this video would not have been possible. They gave me so many different insights I never would have considered, and for that, I am super grateful. Lastly, I want to apologize for how long this video took to make. Turns out writing about a series that's been going for 35 years in its entirety is pretty difficult, but I hope it was worth the wait. Until next time, 